fantastic to work with this core. Uh, today, I'll be talking about how different uh, applications for fact biosequencing can be used in the translational research. And the understanding of the disease, finding biomarkers to diagnose, or finding targets for drug treatment, how it can be done with different applications. But first of all, let's talk about how PAC biosequencing works. Many of you know that, but I really love this slide. So I, I bring it for any presentation and show it at the very beginning because it's incredibly simple. Back biosequencing is elegant and not complicated. We all start with a high quality DNA. It's double-stranded DNA, either genomic DNA or cDNA. During library preparation, as you can see on the left of the slide, we apply smart bells, effectively creating a circular molecule of DNA. And uh, on our smart cells, which is equivalent of the flow cell. Polymerase lands on that circle and goes round and round and round and round and round and successfully generating multiple reads of the same insert. And as you see on the center of the slide, uh, you can generate very, very, very accurate consensus out of that because if polymerase was going over the insert and made a mistake, it's okay. Because on the second round, it's very unlikely that it makes mistake on the same spot. So when you make a consensus, you achieve 99.9% .9 accuracy, which is equal to accuracy for SNP detection of uh, Illumina system and much more accurate than any uh, competitors. It's accurate, it's uh, elegant, and uh, it's the system which was uh, used by nature for mil uh, millions of years, that circular amplification of the plasma, that's, that's pretty much what it is. So that's how it works. And what can you do with PAC biosequencing? Quite a few things. You can look at the genome, at epigenetics, at the transcriptome, and all that apply to translational research. Not only it can do uh, detection of structural variants and a single nucleotide variants. Now you're not talking about three, uh, uh, one genome when you sequence. You're looking at two because you can do phase resolution and you can see the paternal and maternal lines separately. You can look at the repeat expansions, which are undetectable by any other technology. You can see methylation in the same run without any changes. You look uh, with, with RNA sequencing, isoseq, you look at the isoforms and gene fusions. You can do single cell analysis, both DNA and RNA. And uh, it is applicable for any precision medicine on translational studies. As you can see on the right, it's an example of cancer treatment when um, detecting of correct variant, correct biomarker can lead to selecting correct drug to treat the patient and that definitely reduces cost, it's more efficient, it's just something everybody looking at not right now. So whole genome sequencing, let's talk a little bit about whole genome sequencing. It takes many, many steps. What uh, your core will do for you, it's at the right end of the slide, but what is upstream of that. How do you need to prepare your DNA? It's actually very important because the higher quality DNA, the better sequencing you get, the better uh, resolution in your sequencing, easier data analysis. Uh, you can, with confidence, use tools and detect very complex structural variants. However, garbage in, garbage out. If you didn't do a very good job, extracting your DNA at the very beginning, don't expect core to give you a fantastic data, which you can use. So what is the solution? Um, 
you probably know that uh, FACBAR a few years back acquired Circulomics, which is a fantastic extraction company. And we normally, in our presentations with FACBAR, don't even talk about that. But we thought it would be fantastic to mention it now because it's a fantastic product. You can get very high quality DNA and we have 21 specific protocols. Does not matter what you start with. Very difficult to extract from algae or blood or tissue. We have protocols for that. It's very easy, very straightforward. The best part, our team is very receptive to working with you on optimizing your protocols. And chances are that you don't just get tech support specialist if you have issues with circulomic extraction, nanobind extraction, but you will get somebody from R&D who will work with you and help you with your extraction protocols. Uh, how it works, it, it's a very interesting. You have that magnetic B, uh, disc in the tube and it's standard bind wash elute protocol but everything binding, DNA binds to that disc. And it's actually hanging down and you can see it like a big jellyfish and it's hardly get degraded through the protocol. And it's very good for using um, in the sequence. And so if you look at this, if you're a little bit familiar with the statistics for successful run, uh, the read length of the fragments inserts or how many gigabases you can get out of successful run. You could see that uh, in this particular uh, table that extraction with uh, bio extraction kits really give you very large and high quality fragments for the insert and you can be confident that sequencing will be good. It is sometimes very important to be able to work not only with the large size of your sample to make a library, but sometimes you have limited amount of DNA and we do have protocols to address that uh, also. And it is incredibly important for a translational research because sometimes you work with liquid biopsy. Sometimes you work with tiny collection uh, from tiny tumor, for instance. And uh, when your DNA amount is limited, you are not limited uh, to doing your sequencing because we have protocol uh, for uh, low DNA input sequencing, which is about 300 nanograms for making a library, or ultra low when you can use five nanograms. It can be applied for translational research, but as well, it's very relevant for working with smaller organisms, so you don't have to worry about uh, amount of DNA. Um, now, I think we'll talk about uh, whole genome sequencing, what PacBio is very well known for and what up till very recently was one of the mainstream applications of the PacBio. PacBio sequencing is very special because it lets you detect things which were not detectable even five years ago. And this is a good example, telomere to telomere. For 20 years after announcement was made that human genome is sequenced, there were gaps. 20% of genome actually was not. And um, investigators settled with 80%. I said, okay. 80% uh, is good enough, but how about dark regions or repeat regions or high GC rich regions, which never was, were sequenced? Now, telomere to telomere consortium, specifically using PAG biotechnology, were able to fill that gaps. And in those gaps, significant amount of potentially clinically relevant structural variants and uh, single nucleotide variants were found. Now we can bring that to clinic. It is incredibly important, but uh, for 20 years we didn't talk about them. So this is absolutely a new stage when we can look at many, many more different things. And yes, next generation sequencing as short read sequencing known 
before made an amazing breakthrough in understanding of disease and understanding of targets. However, it has its limitations. If you see on the left of the slide, you see what next generation sequencing as short read sequencing can detect. Single nucleotide polymorphism, small indels. It cannot generate reference genome. It uh, cannot phase. It cannot do methylation. If you look on the right side of this table, what PacBio HiFi reads gives you? Structural variation, methylation, segmental duplications, phase in haplotype, SNPs, small indels. It's referent quality and uh, all alleles result. And technically, you can look at all the variance classes. Many of them are absolutely have clinical relevance. And also, I actually was talking with um, cancer research investigator, and his opinion is that why cancer vaccine was not developed yet. His idea is that investigators were looking at single nucleotide polymorphism trying to develop cancer vaccine. However, it's not big enough change for immune cell to recognize it as something different. If you look at large structural variants, it can be easier recognized. You can easier develop system when immune cells recognize uh, that bigger, bigger changes in the cancer cells. Of course, it has huge implementation in the rare disease and the genomic Mendelian disease. And this is one example when something absol which absolutely impossible to detect with short read sequencing was detected in patients. So 12 years old female uh, had syndromic intellectual disability. No exome or whole genome sequencing never explain the situation why this happens. There, clearly they could see that it has some gene genetic basis uh, for the disease, uh, but couldn't uh, pinpoint. It happened to be a 12 KB inversion in one of the significant genes uh, which affected uh, SPME9 and uh, VRF1 genes, and uh, it, it is impossible to detect any other way. Only when you have very long stretches when which you analyze. It was explained, and in the future, when you uh, look at the potentials for patients with similar uh, phenotypes, uh, can it... Can it be used as a marker? Perhaps there's many more studies need to be done, but it is a potential marker. And it, 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 there are potential genes to look at when you try to diagnose. This is one of the examples when something very well described was tested again with uh, PAC biosequencing. SKBR3 cell line is a very well known model for studying HER2 breast cancer. It's been used for decades for studying. It's, it's a very good model. And we thought that we knew that model very, very well until of whole genome sequencing and RNA sequencing was performed, isoform sequencing was performed with spike bio oh, technology. It's the high five technology. <laughs> it's mind blowing that smart sequencing revealed 20,000 new structural variants, which tells us that cancer, because of the dysregulation of DNA repair, has lots of different structural variants, which we did not know about. And this actually connects to what I mentioned to you before about cancer vaccine. All those structural variants potentially can be targets for cancer vaccine or for drugs, depending on their clinical relevance. That's a lot of study needs to be done, but something you know you cannot use. 
Um, also, this isosequencing, which we'll talk a little bit about later, uh, there were discovered some uh, gene fusions in the cancer driver genes, and this definitely significant find. It's uh, it's a lot to think about when you think you know something, uh, maybe you don't. And that actually clicks very well with this example because of cancer, pediatric cancer is scary. And pediatric cancer is very similar to rare disease. Very often it has basis in um, genetic uh, predisposition and genetic structure. So infant was born with retinoblastoma. It's not very common. Uh, it's, it's a child and it was impossible to explain with any other technologies or oh, with whole genome sequencing and the cause of the cancer or um, treatment was not exactly clear what, what, what to do with that. Uh, however, uh, um, Hi-Fi sequencing revealed some structural rearrangements in uh, genes uh, involved in tumor genesis and uh, was discovered novel RB1 um, SIH H3 fusion. Absolutely novel. It hasn't been described before. Many of those fusions, uh, BCR ABL, ALK fusions, uh, people know and they understand them, but this was, uh, was absolutely novel fusion. And if you think about that, now we know maybe this time uh, treatment will be developed targeting this particular fusion, which can help to fight this um, horrific disease. This is an example of another paper. And we can go on and on and on. There's just a few selected examples when it's absolutely clear that how simple experiments with better technology can yield something which has clinical relevancy and has potential to be diagnostics tool or target for treatment. This is an example of structural variations in DAX4 gene, which is uh, one of the gene 7% of B and C. Uh, all uh, cancer are characterized by DAX4 deregulation. And uh, in this case, you could see that DAX4 IGH fusion driver mutation actually overexpress uh, and uh, it regulates gene expression completely. It's after you detect it, it's a simple explanation of the problem is detecting it without uh, proper technology is very, very difficult. Now let's talk a little bit about phasing. I could talking about that. Uh, why is that important? It's, uh, the answer is clear. If two point mutations are on the same allele, they can insist, they can have different effect on the disease progression uh, when um, in comparison, they are in trance. They are on different, uh, on different uh, lines of DNA. So with point mutation, for instance, P10 mutations insist you can see more aggressive tumors, for instance, in cancer, and the patient's survival uh, affected by that. So it's clear diagnostic, it's clear indication of potential disease and the prognosis for the patient. However, without phasing, uh, you cannot really say if mutation is in cis or in trans. Um, and, uh, it is, it's been confirmed. So first it was just an idea, but then the more you look at it, you can confirm that. And in this particular paper, you could see that it's one third of TL cases of harbor JAK3 mutations, one of the cancer genes. And if those mutations are in cis, uh, the pre it produces more aggressive cancer uh, for the patient. Of 
so, and double uh, JAK3 mutation drive IL-7 independent growth. So that's direct illustration of effect of the mutations in cis and in trans. Uh, this is an example with multiple TP53 alterations in myeloid leukemia. And um, you can track clonality of the tumor and see how mutations occur and if they new mutations happen in the same uh, mutating strand or a different one. So you could see uh, on the right on this that originally uh, two mutations were detected with the patient in August of 2008 and they were in trans. And uh, in July of 2013, the same patients in the continuous tumor, more, more mutations in TP53 were detected but uh, they were all uh, on the same strand. So uh, on the same, no, on different strand, not, 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 not just uh, on the new one. And it was only detected by smart sequencing. Our whole genome sequencing does not only tell you about the DNA structure, it also tells you about methylation without any additional library prep you need to do. It's not like bisulfide conversion. When you have a protocol to follow through, you just click a checkbox to detect methylation and uh, it will be performed on the instrument. How it's done is very elegant as well. Uh, when our DNA is sequenced on, the, on our instrument, methylation bases take a little bit longer to incorporate but long enough for it to be statistically relevant. So polymerase goes, 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 you detect what base it is, and then it sits a little bit there trying to put that weird base on the strain of the DNA, and then it continues going. And it's statistically relevant, so you can calculate and you can mark methylated, 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 not methylated, methylated. Uh, and you don't even have to do anything. It does not cost you anything, it's just, there, so you can look at the entire methylome um, and the sequencing of your uh, native DNA molecule. And it does have some interesting effect. Now you can detect things which you couldn't detect before. So if you see in this particular example between tumor and normal in the patient, there is a 12 kilobases deletion in the P10 tumor suppressor gene. So P10 does not work very well, tumor does not get suppressed, but it also shows hypermethylation upstream only with, the, with, this, part, with this deletion in killing gene which is involved in P53 pathway, which uh, shows that not only tumor suppressor gene is potentially deactivated, but also upstream hypermethylation change gene, ex gene expression in very important pathway, P53 pathway. Uh, this is for cancer example, and without phasing, you cannot see that. Without detecting methylation, you absolutely cannot see that. And it's also for rare diseases. Uh, you could see that it's the same uh, with the patient with rare disease. There is a, a deletion of, in the, on, on the left, you could see there is a deletion about 5 KB. It's not very fixed number there. It's a little bit longer, a little bit shorter deletions. But it all attributes uh, with the phasing, you could see that methylation change downstream of that deletion. It seems like it's a very common theme and I'm sure the more experiments like that done, the more we understand that and we could see those um, interesting results in methylation, which changes gene expression. So this question, how? Well, that's the next question. Now we talk a little bit about uh, isoseq, which is the term for 
PAC bios, RNA sequencing. What is isosync? If you look at this picture, it represents your RNA sequencing as you know it, uh, unless you do isosync, with short read sequencing. You get tons of puzzle pieces. However, you cannot resolve isoforms. Uh, everybody knows now that isoforms are incredibly important and they can be cell specific, they can be disease specific. And I have a few examples about that uh, a little bit later on my presentation, but with short read sequencing, you cannot detect those. However, with long read sequencing, it's quite trivial. You have one contig, which is one isoform, cap to cap, poly A to cap, and you could see which exons were involved. Uh, were they whole? Were they truncated? Did you have mutations expressed in that isoform? Are all mutations are expressing in all isoforms or they are selected? So it's a complete view and it's a complete different uh, way of looking at the gene expression because Upregulation can be the same, but isoforms could be different. And we are well known already of with bulk RNA sequencing as uh, our isosic matter. There are quite a few publications. A couple of them I'll talk about. And uh, it's it's very well, very robust protocol, which can be used right away. And um, it's been done in neuro research and cancer in very many different applications. My first example is specific isoforms of Alzheimer's disease. That's a gene, APOR2, and uh, many isoforms of this specific gene uh, differently regulated and differently expressed in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, some of them are associated uh, to, to the plague and some are uh, uh, expressed in neurons and some expressed in microglia. And uh, Alzheimer's disease specific variants uh, alter cell surface expression and receptor processing. Um, that's clear indication that those isoforms can be used uh, as a prognostic or as drug targets for Alzheimer's disease because uh, aberrant one can be targeted somehow with the drug. Going back to cancer, this is a very good illustration of utility of different isoforms. Um, in this example, uh, investigator from Jack's lab decided to look at the breast cancer patient samples and cell lines and xenografts to see if she could discover any different isoforms of uh, splice variants associated with breast cancer. And uh, so she did, she looked at the isoforms and she compared them with the gene code. Two thirds of identified isoforms were novel. They were not in catalog or novel in catalog or novel not in catalog. So uh, something significant, two thirds, that, that's a lot, especially talking about breast cancer. How many times breast cancer RNA sequencing was performed? Uh, probably nobody can count, but that was impossible to detect them. They got very excited about that and decided to look uh, a little bit further and then realized that 21 were completely absent from gene code of 35 associated with patient survival. So 35 isoforms clearly were associated with cancer <laughs> survival. And out of them, 21 ones were not even in gene code, and uh, 10 of them were enriched in specific cancer types, which means that those can be used uh, for profiling the cancer and uh, guiding the treatment. 
when they look a little bit farther and they looked at the oncogene associated with breast cancer, they could see that every single oncogene had isoforms not discovered before. And um, in HER2, there were, I think, 75 isoforms. And HER2, we already talked about the cell line. For studying, HER2 is a very, very well uh, described or oncogene. So discovering that was very, not only very interesting, we know that it has clinical relevance and um, their work needs to be done to see if it can be used for treatment or for diagnostics. You might say, okay, we talk about RNA splice isoforms, but proteins are what matter. Maybe it's not that important to see uh, isoforms. We want to see proteins. And this is a very relevant thing because if RNA degrades and it does not make protein, maybe it's not that very much important. Uh, until now, it's very hard actually to detect full length protocol. If you do really expensive experiment with oh, mass spectrometry, you do see some peptides and you can try to assemble them together into a protein. And it makes sense. However, if you combine long read RNA sequencing and you have your isoform sequence, understanding which axons are present in the isoform, and then you take uh, your peptides, your small peptides like on the bottom and align them with that information you got with isoSIG you get to proteogenomics when you know which protein form was in your mixture. You can create a catalog of proteins. And if domain is missing, if you work with proteomics at all, you know that it can be a huge difference in the protein structure, in the folding, in how protein performs. So you look at that and you could see that now you can absolutely align your peptides with, uh, with the data from mass spectrometry and get your protein library. And uh, that gives you even more confidence in your previous finding with RNA because now you can also look at the expressed product, product uh, expressed protocol and many, Many, many of them are absolutely not in catalog. They haven't been described yet because some domain is missing or some exon is missing or present or weird combination, which is not very well represented even. And it's a rare isoform, but it can have very significant impact. Not only we can work with bulk RNA sequencing, isoform sequencing. Now we also can work with the single cell. And this question asked a lot by cancer researchers, by immunologists, because what one cell does does not, uh, does not mean another cell has to be doing. And uh, gene expression of that not, not only can help you classify the rare cells, but also understand their function. Um, and it's it's not a surprise that single cell omics is nature method of 2019 and spatial transcriptomics is nature method uh, technology of 2020 and uh, long read sequencing is nature method of 2022. If you combine all that together, all of a sudden you have a very good picture and not a surprise that with single cell RNA sequencing, one significant discovery was made. And this is BCL gene, um, splice variants of BCL gene. There are two splice variants, short and uh, long. One is with two exons, as you can see uh, over there. Uh, and one with three exons, one little insert. What does little insert of one exon does? So short isoform of BCL gene is pro-apoptotic. That means it does trigger apoptosis. That means it prevents cancer. 
three axons isoform actually anti-apoptotic, which means that it supports cancer progression. One gene, two different isoforms. And uh, with single cell research, it was possible to discover because it, uh, it definitely cell specific. It's just in one cell. It's not in the bulk. That's how it might start and how it might start the cancer. Mm -hmm. And that leads us to understand that short read up and down regulation is not enough to profile cells and understand which one carries aberrant isoform or rare isoform, um, how we can use long read sequencing and uh, we can classify all the cell lines in single cell manner. One of the most diverse in isoform part of the body is brain. Uh, it's been published many times of different isoforms associated with microglia, astrocytes, neurons, healthy neurons, uh, variants of, in the synapses. It's just something which changes completely and changes differently. And uh, this paper actually just scratched the surface on that. They identified 200,000 unique isoforms in more than 22,000 genes associated with brain. And 70% uh, and, uh, of them were novel. And it can, it, it can actually expand what, remember what I was talking about proteogenomics? It expands proteome, but more than 90,000 different proteins which could be expressed. It's a significant finding, and um, maybe it does help with understanding neurodegenerative diseases, uh, such as Alzheimer's disease or dementia, because no genomics ever explained those diseases before. So single cell isoform sequencing reveals cell type specific isoforms such as this associated with aging down syndrome brains or different cell lines and cell specific variant expand, ex, uh, expression. So now if you look at the different isoforms, you also can track those SNPs you detected before in your DNA, how they express in different cells and in different isoforms. And then in this paper, p somatic mutations, uh, they contribute to spectrum of cerebral overgrowth. And uh, exon 5 variant carried one mutation and exon 9 variant, uh, another mutation they were associated with different cells. So it was definitely a useful tool to profile those cells and further look into the function. Um, a little note of single cell RNA sequencing. Yeah, white pack bio, let's uh, address elephant in the room. Why not to do that with Oxford nanopore, for instance? Uh, there are reasons of it's, imagine that you're trying to do single cell uh, RNA sequencing and you have UMI. If there is an error on that UMI, that read will be thrown away. If the error is generated in one in 80 base pairs, you can imagine that with 40 million reads, you have very many reads which will be tossed away just because it's incorrect the UMI. And another thing is a breakpoint. Uh, accuracy of the breakpoint of the splice variant is very important. And if your polymerase makes mistakes, if your pore makes mistakes, uh, you cannot use that data. It, it will be aberrant. So it's just a small note because uh, people ask. So I decided to be a little bit proactive and tell about it even before uh, we got to the question and the answers on that. What can, do, what can be better than single cell uh, sequencing? Single cell sequencing 15 times. 
With Broad Institute, we developed a protocol which uses concatenation to sequence at the same time, not one cell, not one tube, uh, not uh, two cells, but increased number of cells which you can sequence at the same time uh, to entire, for example, 10x library. Uh, if you think about that, uh, high fi polymerase can sequence 15, 20 kilobases fragments. However, normal transcript is about one and a half, two KB. So if you se uh, sequence just one transcript, you are wasting so much sequencing capability. If you glue them together in a big chain, about 15 kilobases, you can maybe sequence 10, 15 uh, transcripts in one pass of the polymerase. And that's what we developed with Broad. It's a protocol called MassSeq method, throughput increase through concatenation. And you could see that it uh, shows the same data as without concatenation, very accurate. Right now we have a kit which works with 10X library, 10,000 cells in one run. It's a very good yield. Uh, there are options to work with pars, if you do single cell with pars or five prime, it requires a little bit of tweaking and different oligos, but nothing dramatic. You still can do that. However, a uh, mass kit with three prime 10X kit is very straightforward. It's very easy to do. Uh, so we recommend that. And um, very soon we have something very exciting coming. We'll have bulk. Mass seek, which means that you can have your bulk RNA from tissue, uh, for instance, or blood, and then you can do eight uh, isoseq reactions, eight samples in one high fire run, which brings the cost uh, per sample from $1,200, about $200 per sample. That, that's for the reagent. Of course, there's other costs associated with that, with the core, but this is just in the reagent. So you can see that it will be significantly less expensive, much more affordable. It's very hard to ask somebody, okay, do I seek experiments with me? And you ask, how much does it cost? And that's like, uh, about $1,500, $1,500. A hundred uh, dollars, and you say thank you. No, I don't have that budget. Now you don't have this excuse. Everybody needs to be doing isosic when this kit is out. And the same will have for sixteen uh, S for the bacterial research. Uh, it's coming very very soon. I suspect it might be announced at a H A S H G or the very latest in December. So get ready, get your RNA ready because it's going to be fantastic. As far as are we talking about a translational research, we do move to the clinic already. We have a few available uh, applications which successfully were utilized in clinic. Uh, there was a press release recently uh, that a whole genome sequencing is using for diagnostics uh, in, uh, with our partners and GeneDX is getting that ready. Uh, you can look at the germline DNA, you can look at pharmacogenomics, uh, germline testing, you can look at the RNA and develop the panel of fusions which are clinically relevant and can describe cancer and guide treatment. You can look at the isoform detections. So we are ready for um, the translational and clinical applications. And it's uh, very exciting for us because that's, that's what we are trying to achieve. We are trying to help. Um, we want to be in the diagnostics and clinical area, not only in the uh, basic research. 
so when you talk about translational, you always talk about omics, omics this, omics that, epigenomics, uh, proteomics, uh, transcriptomics, uh, genomics, uh, all the omics. So uh, addressing omics is, is a very important thing. And uh, this is a very recent preprint and um, some very amazing work. Maybe it's not 100% applicable to ICBR uh, work right now because as it was done on the new generation instrumentation, but it's good to think about it. And maybe uh, the core will have radio soon, or maybe somehow we can figure out how to use that on SQL 2E, just a few smart cells. I just wanted to tell you, because this is one of the most exciting preprints I've seen in the last year. And this preprint uh, is University of Washington, they apply very interesting strategy to look at the chromatin structure, methylation, isoform expression, and uh, structural variants in genome in one radio run. So how they do that? So first they extract DNA and RNA. They take part of the RNA and they have an enzyme which actually was of designed and is produced now by, by that particular lab, a methyl transferase, which actually of affects chromatin co connected with DNA. So technically you don't sequence those areas and you sequence just open areas and it gives you information where DNA was wrapped around the chromatin and which areas were open. So that's one part that's uh, epigenomics and understanding the chromatin. They run whole genome sequencing of just as I described before to see structural variants. That's second omics, second part of the RNA, DNA. They take RNA and they make cDNA, make isoseq library with RNA. And what, then they combine that together in very specific proportions, and they run it on one, one cell of radio. On the outcome, it's six to one uh, DNA to RNA. And uh, after they run that, they have all the structural variants. They have chromatin, understanding of chromatin structure. They have isoforms. And uh, they have methylation because methylation comes uh, free with whole genome sequencing run. So that's the outcome. Um, and they actually did apply that to real clinical sample, not just like, oh, there's a protocol. Now we don't do that. So they took undiagnosed disease network patient and they performed that run, just very, very multi-omics run on one smart cell, they ran that experiment. The patient uh, showed some uh, phenotype uh, with developmental de delay, uh, retinoblastomas and uh, acidosis, polymicro polymicrogyria. That, 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 that word I don't know, but I, I just read it from the screen. And uh, they did a uh, karyotyping of that patient. They found uh, some uh, translocation uh, to the X chromosome. They found some things, but just a little bit. And they found that 95% uh, of cells, uh, maternal chromosome was inactivated in 3% of cells of a paternal uh, chromosome was inactivated. So some very strange results on the chromosomes and uh, still it was hard to explain why all those things are happening with poor child and why child shows those phenotypes. Uh, however, when they combine the data of isoform sequencing together with whole genome sequencing and chromatin epigenome, they explain quite a few things. Uh, you could see that certain fusion, which was detected by transcriptome, contributes 
to uh, those phenotypes on the right. Uh, couple efficiency and NBA gene in genome contributed to developmental delay. Inappropriate X chromosome inactivation of RB1 detected by chromatin epigenome, explained it right in a blastoma. And then CPG metalome, chromatin, and transcriptome together uh, show the transcri transcriptional uh, read through silencing of gene MAB 21L1, which apparently did not show any impact. So you, you could see that combining all those omics together, every single aspect got resolved by different answer. If you exclude from that transcriptome, you wouldn't explain certain things. If you did not look at the genome, you couldn't explain. And what mind blowing for me is, is just in one run in one experiment combined together. It's a big complex run, but still uh, it's something I think, which is a future of the diagnostics, not just running bazillion tests, but just running one very complex multi-omics assay and understanding things. And um, uh, as I said before, and I want to mention that again, we, do get adoption by clinical labs, fusions and somatic uh, structural variants, uh, carrier screening, rare disease causes, BCRL able uh, fusion, TK1 resistance of different diseases which we can address right now with our tests. Test can be made, a test can get approved as laboratory uh, developed tests. It's a prime time for looking at those biomarkers and bringing them for the clinic. So I think that was a lot of the different applications, but I think it's uh, completely clear that it's, it's exciting. It's a new age and uh, it's something we can apply right now. And uh, a lot of work needs to be done. So bring your samples to the core. <laughs>